Today I'm joined by my colleagues, Councilmember Blumenfield and Councilmember Rodriguez. My name is Nithya Raman. Mr. Verano, can you please call the roll? Certainly, Madam Chair. Councilmember Raman? Here. Councilmember Buscain is absent. Councilmember Monica Rodriguez? Here. Councilmember Bob Blumenfield? Present. We have three members who have a quorum, Madam Chair. Great. Today we have 10 items to consider on the agenda. I'll run through the items briefly and then um, we can uh, move to public comment. Uh, item one is a CAA report and a report from the Bureau of Engineering regarding CEQA's exemptions for two bridge home sites, one in CD5 and one in CD8, and lease extensions uh, for both of those um, and the 14th homelessness roadmap. Item two is a CAO report about the fourth round of application for HAP funding, which is the Homeless Housing Assistance and Prevention Funding provided by the state of California, um, which is on a more stringent timeline this year than previous years. Item three is the Homeless Strategy Committee report regarding the en enhanced comprehensive homelessness strategy for quarters two, three, and four for fiscal years 2021 through 22. Item four, um, is a CAO report regarding a request made by CD by two council district to extend, extend HAP round two funding authority by one year for uh, North Valley caring services. Item five is a HHH administrative oversight committee report um, about their uh, bond issuances and project expenditure plans. Item six is a CLA report and a LASA report regarding the use of naloxone to treat opioid overdoses among um, people experiencing homelessness and training and distribution for these resources among city staff and LASA staff. Item seven is a motion from Councilmember Rodriguez um, asking for the CAO to provide an overview of the program model associated costs and program results for the recreational vehicle pilot program in CD7. Item eight is a motion from Councilmember Blumenfield regarding the local homelessness plan and investment um, plan of LA County submitted to the Department of Healthcare Services, um, the Housing and Homeless Incentive Program, and funding to expand street medicine and mobile mental health and healthcare programs in the city. Item nine is a verbal update from LASA about Project Room Key Demobilization, which we've been hearing for a few weeks now. And item 10 is a verbal update from LASA regarding um, preparation. Uh, the survey questions and changes in methodology regarding the 2023 point in time count, um, which we are including on the agenda uh, today, um, and they'll be here to answer questions and, and take some feedback from members of this committee. Um, before we move to public comment, I believe that there is an amendment on item one. Um, and if uh, Mr. Villanueva, you could read that into the record. Um, um, we can move into public comment at that time. Certainly, Madam Chair, but would you like me to uh, read the uh, instruction for them to dial in? Uh, let's read the amendment and first, and then we can um, uh, move to the instructions for public comment. Um, got it. Okay. Uh, for item number one, the amendment uh, starts with approve up to 436,828 from AHS GCP fund number 100 slash 56 account number 000931 to the Bureau of Engineering Special Services fund number 685-50, account number 50VVIA, salaries and mileage for homeless roadmap to reimburse general salaries and transportation co costs associated with the construction costs of previously approved interim housing sites and feasibility studies. A transfer 436,828 from the BOE Special Services Fund, fund number 685-50, account number 50VVIA, salaries and mileage for homeless roadmap to the following departments as needed to reimburse general salaries and transportation costs associated with the construction costs of previously approved interim housing sites and feasibility studies. BOE salaries general in the amount of 260,878, BOE transportation cost in the amount of 950, Bureau of Contract Administration salaries general in the amount of 114,222, BCA transportation cost in the amount of 3,861, 
BCA fringe benefits cost in the amount of 56,917 and be authorized the controller to appropriate a total of 436,828 from BOE Special Services Fund Number 682-50, Account Number 50-VVIA, salaries and mileage as needed to reimburse homeless roadmap costs to the following BOE and accounts for roadmap technical support services. 260,878 to BOE Fund Number 100-78, Account 1010 Salaries General, $950 to BOE fund number 100 slash 78 account 3310 transportation 114,222 to BCA fund number 100 slash 76 account number 001010 salaries general 3,861 to BCA fund number 100 slash 76 account number 003310 transportation and 56,917 to BCA fund number 100 slash 76 account number 536101 bridge benefits. <laughs> okay, well, that was quite a mouthful. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Villanueva for reading that. Um, at this time, let's move over to public comment. Um, I'm going to take public comment on all items on the agenda. Speakers are going to have one minute if they're speaking on one item, two minutes if they're speaking on multiple items, and one minute for general public comment uh, additionally if they request it. Uh, we have um, Geetha O'Neill uh, to provide guidance to the public as they prepare to call in, and then I'll move to you, Ms. Villanueva, for instructions for um, how they can call in. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. To the members of the public calling in, when it's your turn to speak, please state your name and which of the agenda items you would like to speak on. You have one minute to speak on one agenda item or two minutes to speak on two or more items. In addition, those who would like to address the committee with general public comment will be provided one additional minute for a maximum up to three minutes per person for all agenda items, including general public comment. We will form you when your time is up. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you are speaking on an agenda item, I will give you one brief warning. If you do not immediately get clearly back on topic, or if you again stray off topic, you will forfeit the rest of your time and we will move on to the next speaker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Villanueva, if you wanna read the instructions for the public wishing to call in. Certainly, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252. Again, the number is 669-254-5252. And use meeting ID number 160-453-9676. Again, the meeting ID number is 160-453. 9676 and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 to request to speak. Great. Let's move Hello. over to public comment. Thank you, Councilwoman. Give me a few minutes or a few seconds, sorry. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. All right, and from Craig for general public comment. Perfect, you have one minute for general comment. Please begin. All right, I see business as usual is continuing. You're continuing to allow Gil Cedillo, who isn't even gonna be on this council, whether he wants to be or not after this week. You're still considering his items. Um, item number six, I believe it is was literally introduced by Sadia, not even seconded by Gil. It was just introduced by him. Why are you allowing him to do this kind of legislating from home or whatever? At least force him to show up and face the people. Um, none of his items should be considered. He's racist, anti-black, anti 
tenant anti pretty much anyone. Um, he needs to, his item should not be considered. Um, you're continuing to, um, this council and this committee are continuing to plow through 4118 motions, more 4118. Um, you need to stop with the 4118, abolish 4118. 4118 is not solving anything. It's just causing harm to our unhoused neighbors, forcing them to move across the block so rich people won't have to see them. Maybe instead of, you know, traumatizing unhoused people being violent towards them, maybe you should just give them housing and services like a decent human being would do. Um, yeah, so no resignations, no meetings, stop considering the old items and stop considering KDL's items. Abolish 4118. Thank you, Connor. That was a minute. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. My name is Kristen Astor. I'm calling on behalf of item number six. Perfect. So you have one minute for the item. Please begin. Thank you. Um, my name is Kristen Astor. I'm calling on behalf of the People Concerned for one of the county's largest housing and social services agencies. Um, we appreciate Chair Rahman considering this motion today as well as the rest of this honorable committee. The people concerned is an expert in connecting the people on the streets, bringing them inside, and then keeping them inside. Drug overdoses are sadly the leading cause of death among people experiencing homelessness in LA County. Specifically to count our opioid overdoses, the people concerned has been using naloxone since 2018 and distributing to community members since 2020. In our last fiscal year, our agency distributed over 3,500 naloxone overdose prevention kits and reversed at least 56 opioid overdoses. We train all our staff and interns in the use of naloxone and all community members that receive naloxone from us. We believe that more agencies and individuals need to have access to naloxone and be prepared to administer it to prevent rising uh, avoidable opioid overdose deaths. We strongly support the recommendations regarding the training of additional city staff on the use of naloxone and the staff of organizations who contract with department to counter people experiencing homelessness. We also support efforts to sponsor or support legislation regarding drug overdose prevention and treatment and expanded harm reduction efforts. So thank you so much again to the committee for their time today on this motion, and I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. There are no more callers in the queue, Councilwoman. Wow. Okay. Well, um, thank you to all the callers who called in. <laughs> um, at this time, I'm going to recommend that we take Item one as amended and items four and five on consent, unless there are any objections from the rest of the committee. Okay. You good? Good. Okay, great. Um, okay, Mr. Vano, can you please call the roll? Council member Raman? Yes. Council member Rodriguez? Council Member Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Council Member Rodriguez. Should we wait for Council Member Rodriguez? Um, I believe so. Maybe she's having some technical issues. Because if we don't have her vote, we actually don't have a quorum to pass the item. So. Yes. Apologies. We're just going to wait for one more moment until we figure out what's happening. Okay, 
Um, looks like Councilmember Rodriguez is back. So, uh, can we call the roll on? We have. Um, I wanted to recommend that we take items one, four, and five on consent, unless you have any objections from the rest of the committee. Um, and if not, I'm going to go ahead and call the roll once again on this item, on the consent items. Go ahead, Mr. Villanueva. Um, Council Member Raman. Yes. Council Member Rodriguez. Aye. Council Member Blumenfield. Aye. The items are approved on consent and item one is approved as amended, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Let's move on to item two. Uh, Mr. Verano, can you please read the item into the record? Item number two is a CAO report or city administrative officer report relative to the homeless housing, homeless housing assistance and prevention round four grant application and funding. Thank you. Um, and I believe we have a CAO. Oh, we have Brian Buckner here from the CAO to, to provide us a summary of this item. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, as noted, this is a, a CAO report on the fourth round of the HAP for or the, the HAP grant application. Uh, the report uh, itself outlines the application uh, timeline and process. And then uh, appended to the report is the copy of actually the, the full HAP application uh, that was submitted to the state. It includes uh, narrative responses to a series of, of questions and then a series of data tables uh, that were required for, for the application itself. Um, the application was actually due uh, to the state on November 29th. Um, unlike the HAP 3 uh, the HAP3 application where we were required to have uh, the data tables and a portion of the application agendized for the council prior to submitting the application. In HAP4, they allowed us to submit the application with the commitment that it would be agendized at a future date. And then any amendments uh, that would be necessary uh, to be made to the application can be submitted through the statutorily prescribed amendment process. Um, during the application, the city, county, and LASA uh, worked closely together to establish uh, our outcome goals and to develop strategies that would be uh, helpful in achieving them. The baseline data um, used for establishing the goals actually comes from the state, um, comes from their homeless data integration system, HDIS. Uh, and we didn't receive the, um, the baseline data until about mid-October. Um, so the, the application timeline was actually um, uh, quite truncated. Oops, sorry, uh, whose who's data is HDIS? So the, the data that we use for the baseline uh, to establish the, the goals that comes from HDIS. The HDIS, the way that it works, as you may know, the local continuums of care submit their data to the state. The state cleans uh, under... Uh, unduplicates the data, does their own analysis, and then they send that back to the continuums to use for the HAP application. Um, so we received ours about mid-October. Um, during the process, we actually also met with the state uh, to talk about the application and to talk about our goals. Um, the county and LASA uh, also attended that because the uh, although we are submitting our own application, the city has its own independent application, our application is really one part of a consolidated application for the city, the county, and for LASA as the, the continuum of care. The state actually evaluates our three applications together. And in fact, they indicated to us at the beginning of the process that they would have preferred that we would submit a joint application. Um, but the city, county, and, and LASA staff that we were working with agreed that it would just be a little bit easier given the, the size and complexity of the applications and the strategies involved that we would continue to submit our own separate applications applications. Um, we, you know, continue to have a, a good working relationship with the state, um, and then we expect to continue to work with them through the uh, amendment process as necessary. Um, a few things uh, to point out. Um, as I noted, again, the goals uh, are required to be set at the continuum of care level. That That's not... Um, uh, that that's mandatory, and so that's why you'll see that the the goals are set for the larger continuum, and they're not city specific goals. Um, as I mentioned, the application was actually due the 29th, but we can submit amendments as necessary. The three applications will be considered together, 
And the funding categories that are outlined on page two of our report that we're asking you to approve, similar to HAP3, this is just to create um, essentially the buckets that we would use to then further program the specific programs and services. And so before we actually program a single dollar of HAP4, we will bring those reports back to council with recommendations for how those dollars will be spent. This isn't this isn't uh, actually spending any of the HAP4 dollars, this is just sort of creating the buckets from which we, we can. And the, the six buckets that we created, interim housing, skid row, rapid rehousing and housing navigation, outreach, hygiene, prevention, and supportive services, youth experiencing or at risk of experiencing homelessness, and then administrative costs and system support are the, the same categories that we've used in all of the prior uh, HAP applications. Um, and in order to set the percentages of the allocation, we, we used HAP3. Um, in particular, just given the timeline that we had to, to complete the application, we used HAP3 as a guide for how we would break down those dollars. Um, similar to uh, HAP3, uh, we expect the city's allocation to be just over $143 million. And also similar to HAP3, there will be bonus funding available. Uh, the state has not told us yet how the bonus funds will be allocated. Um, uh, but in order to be uh, uh, able to access the, the bonus funding, the, the, we would have to meet all of our goals. It's, it's similar to HAP3 in that it's an all or nothing. Uh, we have to meet all of our goals in, in order to be bonus eligible. Um, and then the last thing I'll, I'll say before I um, turn it over to you for, for questions is just that um, I, I understand there may be questions or concerns or you may want to, to make changes to some of the strategies or funding allocations. Um, the one thing that I would say is I would probably strongly advise against making any changes to the goals themselves. Um, because as, as I said, the goals have to be set at the COC level. And so LASA and the county are submitting the same goals for their applications. And so if we make changes to ours, we then have to work with the city and county to come to some negotiated agreement about, about their goals as well. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, there can be a process through which we can amend those goals in partnership with the, the state. And given the governor's reaction to the HAP3 application, we anticipate that there might be um, some additional work uh, that has to be done on those goals. Um, but I think you know, it's perfectly, perfectly appropriate um, if you wanted to make changes to the strategies. Again, I would just advise against making any changes to the goals, at least without um, not without conversations with the county and LASA um, together. And with that, I'll turn it over to questions. Can you talk a little bit more in detail about the goals that you've put together here uh, in partnership with the county and LASA? Um, yeah, in, in detail. I mean, do you want me to to go over and read the read the goals? Is that reading the goals and identifying the data sources through which you'll be holding the city and the continuum of care accountable to those goals would be helpful. Of course. Uh, so the goals um, are are as follows. Uh, goal one A. Um, states that HDIS, again, the, the data integration system for Los Angeles Continuum of Care, will show 81,485 total people accessing services who are experiencing homelessness annually, representing 807 more people and a 1% increase from the baseline. Uh, goal 1B, data for the Los Angeles Continuum of Care will show 48,063 total people experiencing unsheltered homelessness daily, representing 485 fewer people and a 1% reduction from the baseline. Uh, goal two, HDIS data for the Los Angeles Continuum of Care will show 36,248 total people become uh, newly homeless each year, representing 366 fewer people and a 1% reduction from the baseline. Uh, HDIS, uh, sorry, goal three, HDIS data for the Los Angeles Continuum of Care will show 9,166 total people exiting homelessness into permanent housing annually, representing 679 more people and an 8% increase from the baseline. Goal four, HDIS data for the Los Angeles Continuum of Care will show 170 days as the average length of time that persons are enrolled in street outreach, emergency shelter, transitional housing, safe haven projects and time prior to move in for persons enrolled in rapid rehousing and permanent housing programs annually, representing 11 fewer days and a 6% reduction from the baseline. Uh, goal five, 
HDIS data for the Los Angeles Continuum of Care will show 10% of people return to homelessness within two years after having exited homelessness to permanent housing, representing a 1% reduction from the baseline. Uh, goal six, HDIS data for the Los Angeles Continuum of Care will show 4,563 total people served in street outreach projects, exit to emergency shelter, safe haven, transitional housing, or permanent housing destinations annually, representing 338 more people and an 8% increase from the baseline. Um, uh, and so I know we have colleagues from LASA who, who are here, um, and they may not have necessarily been prepared to present for this uh, item. Um, they're also here for, uh, for another item, the Enhanced Comprehensive Homeless Strategy. Uh, but but I'm, I'm, if they wanted to, to jump in and say how the uh, they plan to measure, but essentially we'll man manage it through HMIS and measure the, the people served, the people who exit permanent housing from, uh, from all of the different sources. And then um, again, use that to report back to the state and track progress on, on each of those goals. Did, sorry, you wanted Lassa to present on that right now to talk about that? Oh no, if if they if they wanted to, uh, if there was something else that they wanted to add, I, I didn't know if there was more information. In sure, if, well, yeah, if Lassa has any additional information they'd like to add to the discussion of the goals and how these were arrived upon, I had a follow up question. If not, I, I actually uh, was not directly involved in the development of the goals and was not planning to to present today. So I'm glad to come back with additional information uh, as requested. Um, and can you talk a little bit more about how these goals were arrived at? Because I think, you know, we read the headlines related to the governor kind of rejecting some of these goals as not being ambitious enough. I'm looking at the numbers and, um, you know, the the goal for this spending for HAP4 shows that you're hoping that with the spending of all of this money that's coming in, that you're going to see a 1% reduction in unsheltered homelessness over the next um, next year? What is, I'm not sure the time period that this particular application covers, because I don't know when the money will be awarded. But can you talk a little bit more about how this goal number was arrived at and uh, whether it's impacted by the governor's push for us to be more ambitious about what we're trying to do here in Los Angeles with regards to homelessness? Yes. Um, so. In, while we were um, in the process of creating our application, you know, part of it, is the um, application process requires us to meet with uh, the state, and it's the California Interagency Council on Homelessness, Cal ICH, that manages the HAP grant program. And, uh, you know, during the application process, that's when the governors sort of rejected the, the HAP3 applications. Ultimately, our HAP3 uh, application and goals uh, were approved without further modification. We did have to provide some additional kind of supplemental information and context um, around how we arrived at the goals, but the goals themselves uh, were ultimately approved without uh, without modification. Um, and and part of uh, the discussion with Cal ICH was that given that the the, the governor's concern was really around sort of goals one A and one B, the, the reduction of homelessness overall and, and goal one B, which is the reduction of unsheltered homelessness. Um, we felt that those are uh, particularly one A, the reduction of homelessness overall was probably the, the least predictable of all of the measures, given all of the factors that, that go into um, uh, things like inflow and, and uh, uh, levels of homelessness. Uh, we, we didn't feel comfortable Coming up with an outcome goal that would meet the goals or meet the governor's desire for a stretch goal, but that didn't also put the bonus funding at risk. As I mentioned initially, the bonus funding is an all or nothing, and so um, it, we were concerned that if we set too high of a goal and didn't meet it, that that would put potentially tens of millions of dollars at risk um, that we wouldn't be able to, to access. And and in the discussions with the state, uh, the conversation was. You know, this is the goal for as a part of the grant process. However, this doesn't mean that this is the city's actual goal to reduce homelessness. Um, we, we, but this is really just in part uh, as a part of the grant uh, administration. Mr. Wickham, did you have an in, uh, something you'd like to add? Um, yeah, just a couple of technical elements from my recollection of the conversations. Um, one is that the state was very serious about the county 
Lhasa and the city using the exact same goals. And so the, this was tying all of our organizations together in a particular way that needed to be addressed. The other is, uh, I, I recollect that there were some technical issues in the way the state was crafting the analysis. They are using their HDIS, which is the statewide database that's populated with HMIS data, but they do some other um, uh, things with this statewide database. And but it's the same numbers that we're using from HUD, right? The same I mean, numbers for the homeless count, same numbers for all of the base data is for, informed by the homeless count. Exactly. And, and it all comes through the HMIS, but it is um, the, the statewide database has its own technical things that it's doing. Um, and I, as I recall, there were averages that were um, being used as well and how they were measuring these things. And so one of the things that's unique about what has happened historically over the last few years in Los Angeles is that we've had significant increases in the number of people who are on the street. So when you add those significant increases into the measurements, um, the goals that um, had been identified here um, are, 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 are basically saying we're going to stop the growth in, in population that's that's moving onto the street. So that was one of the that was one of the factors that was trying to be addressed in the setting of these goals. And I think it would be um, best if um, somebody from LASA were able to um, walk you through these technical issues that went into um, setting these goals because there were a lot of factors that were playing together uh, to come together for this this joint application. Okay. And I'm going to open up the floor to Lhasa for that, but let me just put a pin in that for the moment and um, turn it over to uh, Mr. Blumenfield. Great. No, and, and just to building on that for a moment, the goals, it's very hard for us to, uh, to really analyze those goals because we don't get the data. We don't know, right, how many people are in inter interim, how, I mean, uh, how long people are staying in term housing, how many navigators are in the system, all of these things that could, that go to the goals that COC has and, and are in HMIS, we don't actually get to see, at least I don't. Uh, so I don't know how to, you know, it makes it difficult to assess the goals, which seem very unambitious, uh, to assess them. I mean, and, and that's, but that's the bigger problem of, of data, I think. Am I wrong on that? Um, I think the KPIs that you had presentations on over the last two meetings will um, start to address those questions that you're asking right now. So um, I think we we might want to have additional presentation from LASA on exactly your point of how do the KPIs and that that new development in reporting and, and managing data will inform this process so that we can move forward and satisfy the the um the the goals that we're putting forward to the state we don't want to as as brian points out we need to make sure that we bring in that extra money from the state that means staying on top of it and having these quarterly kpis should be the tool that you use to monitor the progress on that but i think lawson needs to give us that information yeah. and, and it needs to be broken down ultimately maybe not for the grant but for us into smaller chunks like what what are the what are the goals that lead to the you know the outcomes and 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 let us let us see how those are broken down. I mean, I often feel like we're flying blind uh, on a lot of this stuff. Um, but that being said, I mean this this funding is incredibly valuable uh, to help the city, and without it, you know, we couldn't move forward. So that uh, you don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth and all that stuff. And, and I'm glad. By the way, I'm glad to see rapid rehousing and housing navigation is getting the largest share. Uh, although, as we'll see in item eight, um, I think that there is some of that that can be supplanted with the Medi-Cal money, um, with, the, with the new rules on Medi-Cal for the next two years. But we're going to explore that in, in item eight, so I won't get into that now. But that that could be uh, game changing, I think. Um, I may be wrong, but that's for item eight. Uh, and there are a lot of programs that the city's standing up that are unique, like ADU accelerator programs, shared housing that can expand and get more people into housing if we had the rental subsidies to go with that program. 
Uh, and I guess I'd like to know is this HAP funding, will that be, a, I, it's my understanding that that funding can be used for those kinds of programs, ADU accelerators, shared housing, but I wanna formally ask that because uh, I wanna clarify it. I, I, want, I wanna hope that that is the, the answer. So I'll frame it as a question. Uh, yes, uh, th those, are, those would be eligible uses of the funds. Great. Right. And and I can I can solve like a piece of the data equation. I'm, I'm happy to send you the baseline data that the state sent us. Um, so you'll see it on the back end from HDIS, but I obviously can't solve the front part of that equation about, um, you know, giving you or, or having access of, of the HMIS data that went into or that was sent to the state. Um, but I'm happy to send it to to all of your offices. Right. But I, I think the the point that Mr. Blumenfield was making and one that I think is really important for all of us in the city to be able to understand is speaks to what Mr. Wickham was talking about earlier, which is that we're looking at a 1% reduction in unsheltered homelessness from these dollars, right? And what Mr. Wickham was saying was, if I'm hearing him correctly, is that the increase in the number of people falling into homelessness is so high, the rate of people becoming homeless here in the city is so high, that having a 1% reduction in unsheltered homelessness even with all these additions to the programs is what we can expect given the increase in the number of people becoming homeless at this time. But we as a city right now don't really have the capacity to tell that story. Because let's say we were able to tell that story. Then I think A, it calls for asking for more funds from the state. If they want ambitious goals for us, they should also be giving us dollars to back up those ambitions, right? And then the second piece is to say, what does homelessness prevention really look like? You know, what is what does it mean to reduce the number of people falling into homelessness and what are the dollars look like for that? And so I think that's part of the the challenge in terms of this data is that we get it at the at, at a report end like this. And I feel like there's policy to be made that can target some of the issues that are leading us to some of these very um, modest decreases that we're targeting. But. Uh, we won't be able to make that policy without having that information available to us. I don't want to speak for you, Mr. Blumenfield, but to me, that's where I'm feeling a little bit of my frustration. Oh, uh, you hit it. Hit the nail on the head. <laughs> Great. Um, I want to turn the floor back over to uh, Mr. Uh, Virgao from LASA to provide some feedback. Thank you. Um, so I'd be glad to have our Deputy Chief Information Officer come back and, and speak more to the technicalities of, uh, of HDI, HDIS and how it functions relative to HMIS. That is not my expertise. The piece that I, I wanted to ensure that the um, committee hears also that is that I think is, is really valuable to understand is that, um, especially from, a, at least from a loss of standpoint, and I believe this is um, true in large measure for the city and the county, um, the approval of HAP4 funding uh, primarily serves to extend programs that already exist. Um, for for LASA, uh, with the beginning of the HEAP Say that funding... One Say that one more time. What does uh, HAP do? So beginning with the HEAP funding several years ago and uh, moving through HAP 1, 2, 3, and now 4, uh, because this has been one-time funding, uh, largely... Um, manages to continue programs that already exist, as opposed to being additive year on year on end. So uh, that makes it very difficult to have uh, lofty stretch goals when the funding is continuing existing programs rather than being um, a, a new pot of money additive to to prior money, because each of these pots is time limited, one time funding. Um, so I think that's an important piece to recognize as well. I just wanted to share that and glad to, again, glad to come back with our deputy CIO and talk through the, the data pieces. Okay. Yeah. So let's, let's maybe talk about that in a, in a later meeting where we can bring back the discussion on KPIs um, and the HDIS and HMIS information and the uh, homeless count data and talk about how we can incorporate that into our discussions at the committee level and in the city level in a more um, systematic manner. Unless there are additional questions from Ms. Rodriguez, um, I'm comfortable with um, moving forward on this item and sending it to full council for approval, especially given that we need these dollars desperately um, and don't wanna slow it down in any way, but uh, grateful for all of your uh, feedback and perspectives and, and what went into this. And hopefully we can look forward to building on it. 
Okay. Mr. Villanueva, can you please call the roll on this item? Certainly, Madam Chair. Council Member Raman? Yes. Council Member Rodriguez? Aye. Council Member Blumenfield? Blumenfield, aye. Item two is approved, Madam Chair. Thank you. So let's move on to item three. Mr. Villanueva, can you read the item into the record, please? Certainly, Madam Chair. Item number three is a homeless strategy committee report relative to the enhanced comprehensive homeless strategies, second, third, and fourth quarterly performance reports for fiscal year 2021-22 from October 1, 2021 to June 30, 2022. Great, and we have um, Megan Falcone here from the CAO to present this and for members of the public who may be listening in. Um, this is a interesting report because it's really a comprehensive summary of everything that the city's been doing related to homelessness over this last year. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, if you want to know what the city's been up to with regards to homelessness, this is it. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, members of the committee. My name is Megan Falcone, and I'm with the CAO's Office Homelessness Group. The item before you is the quarterly performance report for the Enhanced Comprehensive Homeless Strategy, or ECHS, for the second, third, and fourth quarters of fiscal year 2021-2022. The reporting dates for this report are October 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2022. The report highlights key accomplishments for these three quarters and provides updates on a the Abridge Home Program, the COVID-19 Homelessness Roadmap, and the HAP Program. It also provides data on 156 metrics from the strategy itself. Beginning with the Abridge Home, or ABH Program, there are currently 26 sites operating with 2,126 beds. These sites provide much needed housing and support services for people experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles. As the ABH program continues, the CAO will continue to monitor and evaluate the lease and license agreements of ABH sites. Moving on to the COVID-19 homelessness, homelessness roadmap, as of June 30th, 2022, 7,387 new roadmap beds were open and occupiable, including 2,246 rapid rehousing or shared housing interventions implemented by LASA. LASA provided operational support for these interventions. One highlight is the implementation of a bed availability feature called the bed reservation system. This system was implemented across a bridge home and roadmap interim housing programs. During the reporting period, the mayor's office launched two new initiatives related to ECHS. The first is the Crisis and Incident Response Through Community-Led Engagement, or CIRCLE program, which responds to LAPD calls involving people experiencing homelessness. This initiative addresses the high volume of calls to LAPD for non-criminal activities. The second is the Street Medicine Program in partnership with the University of Southern California to deliver medical services to people experiencing homelessness. Outreach began in quarter one and the full program launched at the beginning of quarter two. The Street Medicine Program also places individuals into various types of housing and provides hygiene services at high needs locations throughout the city. The report provides additional updates on outreach and hygiene efforts in response to COVID-19. First, the number of people reported by LASA as having received services or referrals by city-funded outreach teams decreased from 5,714 people in quarter one to 4,579 people in quarter two, and then increased each quarter to 5,003 people in quarter three and 6,294 people in quarter four. The Bureau of Public Works Mobile Pit Stop Program serviced 18 locations during the reporting period and served patrons for a total of 947,904 uses. And the Bureau of Public Works Mobile Shower Program serviced 15 locations weekly and served patrons for a total of 10,523 uses. Moving on to the Proposition HHH updates for this reporting period. Nine Prop HHH projects received a temporary certificate of occupancy or a certificate of occupancy during the reporting period for a total of 634, 634 units, 545 of which are supportive housing units. The city closed financing on 30 Prop HHH projects for a total of 1,950 units 
1,558 of which are supportive housing units. Construction started on 25 Prop HH projects for a total of 1,640 units, 1,266 of which are supportive housing units. The report also provides some updates on other city programs. As of June 30th, 2022, a total of 971 new individuals experiencing homelessness or at risk of experiencing homelessness received subsidized transitional employment through the LA RISE program with 2021-22 program funds. In addition, the Community Investment for Families Department expanded the homeless prevention homeless prevention program from eight family source centers into all 15, 16 family source centers, providing maximum coverage throughout the city. To conclude, the CAO continues to coordinate with city departments and LASA on these and other programs, and will continue to provide updates to the city council and homeless strategy committee in future ECHS reports. This concludes my report. Thank you. Sorry, couldn't get myself off mute there. <laughs> well, thank you for that comprehensive report um, about all of the different programs that the city is undertaking with regards to homelessness. I want to open up the floor to my colleagues for questions at this time. Any questions? No, no. I mean, it's, appreciate the report. There's a lot of great numbers in here of, of what we're doing, but it's also self-explanatory. So thank you. Okay, great. Okay, great. Um, so unless there's any question, any further questions, I'm going to ask that Mr. Villanueva call the roll on this. Council Member Raman? Yes. Council Member Rodriguez? Aye. Council Member Blumenfield? Blumenfield, aye. Items approved, Madam Chair. Great. Let's move on to item six. Mr. Villanueva, can you read the item into the record, please? Certainly, Madam Chair. Item six is a Chief Legislative Analyst and Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority reports and resolution relative to the use of naloxone to treat opioid overdose among homeless individuals and naloxone training and distribution for city staff and LASA staff and contracted service providers and related matters. And I believe we have someone here from, is it, is it you, Nathaniel? Going to be yes, I'll, I'll be reporting okay, for LASA. Fantastic. Please uh, take it away. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, fellow committee members. Um, I, I believe I failed to introduce myself earlier, so I apologize for that. My name is Nathaniel Friga. I'm the Deputy Chief of Systems at LASA. Um, I am here today to share uh, some of the information that we provided into the report uh, with some additional information that uh, about activities that have occurred since the report. Um, so um, LASA has been taking the overdose epidemic and, uh, and mortality in general uh, among people experiencing homelessness uh, extremely seriously. We've been involved with uh, the county on um, a work group uh, to reduce mortality among people experiencing homelessness uh, for the last three years. Um, and uh, unfortunately, um, overdose, especially relative to, um, to opiates and specifically um, um, Oh my goodness, I'm blanking on uh, on the drug. Uh, um, uh, artificial opiates. Um, and no, thank you, thank you. Uh, it's it's been a long week, and my brain failed me there. I apologize. Uh, specifically relative to to fentanyl, um, has become the leading cause of death among people experiencing homelessness. Uh, Lhasa has been working with the county in leading efforts to ensure that uh, overdose training is provided across the entirety of the homelessness system. Uh, as you heard from the caller this morning, um, PATH uh, is, is one of the agencies that has been leading that charge um, on the provider side. Um, Lhasa has been conducting trainings 
on uh, the use of naloxone for all of its outreach teams. Uh, for the last, uh, since 2017, we've been um, procuring directly uh, access to uh, naloxone for our outreach teams and training them on the utilization of naloxone. Um, in 2018, we were able to get a significant supply of naloxone from the state and began distributing naloxone to clients, um, not just to those who use uh, opiates, but to those who know people who use, use opiates. Um, it, naloxone is most effective if it is in the hands of those who uh, are using these drugs and or um, for uh, in the hands of those who um, are nearby. Um, it is unfortunate that the vast majority of, uh, of overdoses will occur not in the sight of, of staff members or police or any other uh, official. And so the, um, the drug needs to be in the hands uh, of those who um, are using opiates in order to, uh, to be most effective. So in those efforts, uh, we've been distributing naloxone to um, uh, unsheltered individuals uh, across the county uh, since 2018. Um, in uh, uh, in the last uh, year and a half, with um, uh, coordination with uh, uh, the county, specifically the Department of Health Services, um, we have uh, ramped up our training to ensure that all new staff uh, get trained immediately uh, and that there is additional harm reduction training along with the overdose prevention training provided to our staff, uh, and that is field-based training uh, with the assistance of uh, OEND uh, at the county and uh, CHPLA, which is a, um, a nonprofit organization uh, that provides uh, needle exchange services, syringe exchange services, and harm reduction services across the county. Um, additionally, um, we are... Um, we just recently procured an additional uh, um, um, uh, supply of uh, naloxone from the state uh, and were notified that as a result of uh, one of the settlements around um, uh, uh, with the manufacturers of opiates uh, that, uh, that the state had, they have now additional funding and we're eligible for uh, additional doses and we are applying for those. Uh, we, again, our focus is to uh, hand them out uh, to folks on the street, but we are also um, trying to work as a clearinghouse for any nonprofit that does not have yet have that arrangement with the state. However, uh, we are also working with all of the nonprofits that we contract with to make sure that they are clear on how they can get a standing order with the state and be able to request uh, those dosages from the overdose prevention uh, project at the state level, where uh, any nonprofit that is uh, supporting people experiencing homelessness can be eligible to receive uh, naloxone for distribution to staff, but also, uh, more importantly, directly to clients. Uh, so for those agencies that have not yet uh, been able to complete that process, we are serving as a clearinghouse for, um, for uh, naloxone. Uh, additionally, we are working, again, in partnership with uh, CHPLA and uh, OEND uh, to uh, expand the access to overdose prevention training for uh, all of our interim housing sites. That is the primary focus. Initially, uh, we are expanding into all of our permanent housing uh, sites um, to ensure that uh, staff and clients are receiving this training and receiving access uh, to naloxone. Um, for this fiscal year, uh, LASA instituted a change in our contracts with our providers that requires um, that our agencies uh, have uh, have and provide training for their staff uh, and have access to uh, naloxone and can provide it both to, to staff and uh, to their clients. Uh, so we are uh, fully committed. We uh, additionally, the, um, there is, uh, the county has stood up a steering committee um, to address harm reduction um, across the county, not just for those experiencing homelessness, but with a, a significant focus on uh, the homelessness sector. Um, the, the initial meeting for that steering committee was just this week. LASA is uh, participating and will continue to do so um, and um, will continue to offer trainings to our providers and our staff directly. Um, this uh, We have a firm commitment to ensuring that um, this that we can get a handle on this epidemic and uh, save as many lives as possible. Uh, so I will end my update there. Uh, I'm glad to take any questions. Great, Councilmember Blumenfield. Sir, you're on mute. Thanks. Um, thank you for the report. Uh, it's so important. Uh, I support anyone and everyone getting used 
getting trained on Narcan. It's really simple. Uh, I did it. I had my entire staff do it. We did it during a staff meeting. Um, you know, as you mentioned, there's just, you know, a thousand, 1200% increase, you know, from 109 deaths in 2016 to 1500 now, like this is super preventable and it is super easy to use. Um, it's a nasal spray. And um, so lots of gives it, do you give it to, and, and I know before we were able to get to, to get the Narcan so that me and my staff can carry it with us, uh, we had to get trained and, and that was fine. And we did it. And, and I said, it was super easy. Do, when you give it out to the clients, do they need to be trained? So we, yes, we, we have a train the trainer model with our staff. Um, uh, so these, the training that we provide to our staff, both is so that they know how to administer the, the medication, but also how to uh, inform uh, others how to use the medication. Uh, as you said, it, it is um, uh, virtually foolproof uh, as, as a response in that um, naloxone as a medication um, really only has an impact on someone who has opiates in their system, and that is to block the opiate receptors. Uh, so there are um, very few, if any, uh, potential negative complications if uh, for a wrongful administration uh, of the medication. So if there is uh, you know, if you came across somebody who was unconscious and you believed they um, may be unconscious due to an overdose and administer naloxone, that is not going to cause damage to them. Uh, and so we do provide that training to the individuals uh, with a primary focus on immediate, immediate administration of, uh, of the uh, medication while also calling for emergency medical care because uh, it is not a cure-all um, because of uh, Blocks on only blocks it for a certain period of time, and depending on the amount of opiates in one system, they can fall back into overdose. But I guess I, I was what I was getting at is: is there is it a barrier? Is there a barrier? It taking the training that is somehow preventing it from getting into the hands of 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 the folks who really need it, uh, or is it is it freely distributed? If someone, if you go to an encampment and and uh, you know lots of workers or whoever wants to give the Narcan to someone and say but that person doesn't want to take a training. We will hand it out. You will. Uh, hand it. Yes, okay. the, the medication not itself. Not a barrier in that sense. That's what I was no, worried about. No, 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 sorry. Uh, the medication itself comes with uh, instructions in the packet, <coughs> excuse me, that it, um, are even. So the, uh, the training even, requirement is just for official work for staff. I mean, we had to get the training, but you're saying that's not a requirement when you're handing it out to the public. No, we we do our utmost to uh, to make sure that we can offer training, uh, but we would not refuse to um, to distribute the medication uh, if somebody said I don't have time or I don't want to. Uh, we would rather the medication be in their hands. Uh, again, the instructions are in the medication, including pictograms that are uh, incredibly easy to follow. It is a nasal spray, um, and it is. Um, you, you yeah. answered my question. Thank you. That's that's. It was just a little worry there, and thank you very much. That's it. Sorry, I'm. This is this is work that I'm passionate about. So I apologize if I'm. Uh, no, no, too, you, too yeah, in the weeds. I, I appreciate what you're saying. I, I didn't. I wasn't trying to cut you off. I just. I wanted you to know that that where I was going with the question, and and that you act, you, you nailed it, and you answered it, and so thank you. Great. Um, I just want, we have a CLA uh, report as well in this council file related to departments. So this was Lassa's interaction um, with the issue of Narcan and, and their own training programs. The CLA also did a survey across city departments that engage with people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, and we have Pranita Amatia here from the CLA who is going to provide just a summary of their findings and recommendations um, from this study, because it turns out that there are a large number of city departments that do engage with people experiencing homelessness, some of whom have access to naloxone, but not all. And so if you want to just read the summary uh, recommendations from this survey, I think that would be helpful for us to um, move forward on this item. Sure. Good morning, everyone. My name is Pranita Mathia from the Office of the Chief Legislative Analyst. Um, so like Madam Chair said, uh, CLA did a survey of all city departments who um, are in contact with people experiencing homelessness and either have already received uh, 
training to administer the Loxon or they have opportunities to engage in uh, training to administer the Loxon and um, city departments that do not come into contact with any people experiencing homelessness. And the survey found that there are seven departments that have straight uh, that have staff that have that are actively trained. Um, and then there are 21 departments who encounter homeless individuals during the uh, course of performing their job duties, but have not been trained. And there are opportunities for these departments to engage in um, training in the future. And then there are nine departments that do not have any encounter with people experiencing homelessness. So the CLA report provides um, recommendations instructing the personnel department with working with LASA to report back on steps necessary to train city staff on the use of naloxone. And there's additional recommendations um, for the fire department to report on a program called Leave Behind Program that would uh, get them a grant to, um, uh, to administer this program um, where they leave behind the locks on to uh, emergency calls for future uses. And then finally, the report also has recommendation to adopt resolutions to support um, federal legislation that are related to substance abuse treatment. Great. So um, these are great findings. I think that, yeah, the table, if um, anyone hasn't seen the report, has a list, a comprehensive list of departments that engage with people who are experiencing homelessness and suggest that there are opportunities for training for more staff members at the city around this issue and for the fire department to be able to leave behind um, naloxone and, and then report on the findings. So I am comfortable moving this forward unless there's any additional questions. I'm excited about this work and I'm glad that we heard this report today. Thank you to the both of you for um, for your presentations. Um, with that, Mr. Villanueva, can you call the roll? Council Member Rahman? Yes. Council Member Rodriguez? Aye. Council Member Blumenfield? We feel that. The item is approved, Madam Chair. Great, let's move on to item seven. Can you read the item into the record? Certainly, Madam Chair. Item number seven is a motion from Council Members Rodriguez, Bonin, et al. Relative to an overview of the program model, associated cost metrics deployed to measure success and program results for the recreational vehicle pilot program and related matters. Great. Um, and this is a really exciting pilot um, that has been carried out in Council District 7. So I'll turn the floor over to Council Member Rodriguez. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, just briefly, you know, since the from the 2019 to 2022 homeless count, we've seen uh, an increase of 41% of RVs on the streets of Los Angeles. Uh, many of us know and have experienced the challenges uh, associated with it that, you know, uh, that is frankly uh, multi, uh, multifaceted. Uh, in that with the conditions of what some of these recreational vehicles are the state are the state of the condition of these recreational vehicles, they often present not just uh, high fire danger in certain areas uh, with combustibles and uh, use uh, for heat and whatnot, uh, but also all of the additional resources that we have to deploy because of sewage leakage and a whole host of other concerns. Um, <clears throat> As a result of some of the impacts that my office had seen uh, over the course and the spike uh, over the course of the last couple of years, we've been coordinating with West Valley Yes on a pilot to better facilitate uh, solutions that don't move the homeless population living in RVs from district to district, but rather actually incent their acceptance to housing because what we've often found is that individuals don't often identify as being homeless when they're in the RVs. Uh, and so what we have helped to facilitate is a process that uh, accelerates the uh, disposition process of the RVs with a voluntary uh, surrender with the use of a gift card. Uh, 
um, many of the individuals that have been placed in my district to date, just in the last several months that we've been deploying this pilot is uh, 37 individuals. Uh, over 20 RVs have been removed permanently from the streets and uh, we're just continuing to develop the model uh, working in concert with West Valley Yes, with LA Family Housing, with LASA, and it's already shown tremendous promise. I think, you know, for me, what's incredibly important, one of the things that I think we've suffered through so often uh, in the history of our approaches with homelessness is the um, fragmentation of, of implementation of, of process. It's caused a lot of problems with uh, I think it's left, well, I don't think, I know it's opened us up to liabilities that have ended up, ended us in lawsuits. Um, and so facilitating a process and memorializing it in a manner that actually, uh, you know, provides the actual housing solution, uh, has a concentrated outreach program, uh, most importantly, creates the, the, uh, the standard and approach by which we can uh, protect ourselves from being, uh, you know, from being, uh, from first of all, not having the, to endure the incredible expense by having LAPD's heavy involvement in the disposition process, but a voluntary surrender and working with the nonprofits to facilitate that has created a, a much more um, expedient approach to addressing this problem. Uh, the results of which are in, indisputable in my district and uh, I know we've had other efforts. Uh, it's been attempted in other uh, council districts. Uh, you know, we're engaging in those conversations with other uh, San Fernando Valley council areas. Uh, but we've seen just with this concentrated effort that we've launched in my district, tremendous success and uh, can outline a path forward for the balance of our city to address uh, the high concentration areas in, uh, in other council districts as well. So. Uh, so uh, as a result of, uh, of the work that we've uh, led here, and again, and this is after, uh, you know, for the last five years, I, I created the first uh, RV safe parking in my district and learning from, you know, I'm, I'm always willing to take on the opportunity to uh, pilot something to figure out what a best practice looks like, uh, because I think the best way to uh, develop policy is to actually try and see what works and then know what works and what doesn't work. Um, having coordinated these resources and efforts with uh, all the service providers that we so often have to rely upon uh, in order to help us uh, make informed policy decisions, I think we've developed a, a very uh, you know successful model uh, that would be beneficial to colleagues across the city. And so with that, um, I, I'd like to uh, seek approval of this item so that we can uh, continue the work with uh, the CAO and our service providers to uh, outline a process that would be, I believe, beneficial to the balance of our city moving forward. Great, and I think that this pilot is really, really exciting. We've heard a little bit about it. Um, we've also worked with St. Joseph Center that has done interventions with RVs in, in a couple of other places and he heard some really promising results from there, but I think the payment for um, disposition of the RVs is something that's really unique to this pilot and really, really exciting as a lesson for the city. Mr. Bloomfield, I don't know if you had any other additional comments. No, I mean, I think this is great. And I, I give uh, Mr. Rodriguez a lot of uh, kudos and credit for piloting this. And, uh, you know, I had a number of conversations with the, the West Valley Homes Yes folks about this, uh, as well and and it's just it makes too much sense uh you know which is especially because one of the problems we've had and we've all experienced this is you get somebody who's living in a very dilapidated rv um to move and they just give the rv to the next person so you end up with this substandard living condition being perpetuated even as you um you're getting people out of that situation uh, so this has the you know advantage of being able to avoid that. Now, as I understand it, what we're approving here, just to be clear, we're, we're asking the CAO to come back with the details of that we can approve, the step-by-step -step details of, of how this program is going to work. Correct. Uh, so that's the key, which is right. I mean, so we're going to get we're going to get the information back of how it's going to work. 
we're not, we're not, we don't want to slow anything down. We want to, we want to move at the same time to get them to CAO to figure out where the funding is. And then we get to decide, okay, this is what we're being asked to do. And this is what the funding is that's available. How do we want to scale? And what is it that we are scaling? Because right Correct. now we don't quite know, we know conceptually, but we don't have it, we don't have it laid out in a procedure that we can just, um, you know, uh, the step, the step by step protocol, wash, right? Wash, rinse, and repeat, and and or whatever, or you know, the, right. the step by step. So that's what I understand us we're doing today is Correct. we are we are urging the CAO and in consultation with all these different groups um, to develop this report of how we how we can go it and what are those what are the ten steps or however many that that need to be taken. Correct, and so. Uh, just to further clarify, because apparently it, it uh, there was some, uh, you, we want to make sure that it's been made perfectly clear. Uh, and so just to, to provide the technical clarification uh, for for uh, added comfort, we're just going to invert uh, the way the, the moving clause is worded so that, so I'm just going to provide that right now, just so that it makes it really clear. Because yes, that's exactly what we're doing, Mr. Blumenfield. Uh, it's we're, all we're simply trying to do is make it uh, is memorialize what the process looks like. Uh, right. It will it will inform uh, again the resources that uh, we then choose to allocate to put forward in this process. Um, but it's also you know it's just uh, obviously given the impacts and given the the huge spike that we've experienced, uh, it's important that we move very quickly. Uh, to to get the to to basically help inform the work because uh, you know what we saw for example when when after I did the encampment to home uh, at Paxton and Bradley there were bits and pieces uh, that were implemented in different locations some with greater success rather than others and if we can help inform a more consistent process it doesn't leave us vulnerable to uh, to uh, misinterpretation if you will. Yep. And, uh, and so that's why I think it's incredibly important that when we talk about policy in this city, you know, we, we can't talk about policy adoption district by district. Um, we have to look at these things in, in its totality uh, to move it forward for the benefit of, uh, of the city and for consistency and for, frankly, uh, all the different service providers that are involved. Because yeah. absent, absent that um, very direct uh, informed uh, process to move forward with, uh, that's where we get in trouble. And uh, sanitation, uh, LAPD, everything else, we're trying to minimize and make it more great, you know, have greater efficacy with our work. Uh, but frankly, more consistency is also uh, a very welcomed approach that uh, I think we're all seeking. And so with that, uh, I'm just going to, to further clarify in, in the, for the amend, the, uh, the moving clause, uh, the second moving clause to read that I further moved that the city administrative officer in consultation with the above mentioned service providers and relevant city departments develop a report inclusive of A, a scale up plan prioritizing the uh, rollout in RV hotspots per the 2022 pit count data. B, excuse me, B, procedures outlining role and responsibilities of each agency necessary to execute the model within 60 days, provide recommendations for how to adopt this model, inclusive of outreach, services, housing, RV trade incentives, and logistics for voluntary disposal as a citywide program. Great. I think that makes a lot of sense. So with those, um, with that change, um, with that amended moving clause, I'm prepared to move forward with this. Can you call the roll? Certainly, Madam Chair. Council Member Rahman? Yes. Council Member Rodriguez? Aye. Council Member Bob Blumenfield? Blumenfield, aye. The item is approved as amended, Madam Chair. Great. Thank you so much. Excited to see next steps on this. Let's move on to item eight. Can you read the item into the record? Certainly, Madam Chair. Item number eight is a motion from Council Members Blumenfield and Rodriguez rel relative to the local homelessness plan 
and Investment Plan of Los Angeles County submitted to the California Department of Healthcare Services, the Housing and Homeless Incentive Program, and funding to expand street medicine and mobile health mental health van programs in the city and related matters. And this is a motion from uh, Council Member Blumenfield. So um, I don't know, Mr. Blumenfield, if you wanted to talk a little bit more about why you're excited about this. You know, I think sure. one of the things that we've been talking about in, in talking about the um, um, street medicine teams is about how we can be utilizing uh, state sources of funding and Medi-Cal funding basically to pay for the ongoing costs of street medicine in, in the city of Los Angeles um, by incorporating other sources of funding and just utilizing city funding for our startup costs, which is really exciting. We've been discussing that in previous committee meetings. So I wanted to hear a little bit more about why you're excited about this and, and see how we can, um, yeah. Yeah, get some state funding for for services that we need desperately here in LA. It's very exciting. I mean, even, even though we as a city were not involved in delivery of healthcare, more and more we're dipping into this world out of necessity. And because we're now so involved in homelessness outreach services, it's important that we share our observations and articulate our needs. And I know the current system is too big to respond effectively to the lead needs on the local streets. And sometimes it, we have to zoom into the micro level, focus on individual needs. If through the Medi-Cal reimbursements, we can fund housing navigation and housing retention services, like is being said, I'm hoping we can take those savings. Uh, you know, A, we can double, triple down on them because it's at no additional cost to us. Uh, if Medi-Cal is gonna do it for the next year, like we should be hiring everyone under the sun to be a housing navigator and retention services. And I'm hoping also that that means savings in, um, in our other housing dollars, like I was referring to in the earlier uh, item. Because every dollar we spend out of Medi-Cal that goes above and beyond our housing or can actually supplant money and allow us to spend that other money on some of the other critical needs that we have. Because we know that, um, we know we need this. Uh, so, we need, we need to first make sure we have a seat at the table as a city and that we're in the working, working with our partners to ensure the implementation of the, uh, the HHAIP or that HHIP is successful. I don't know what, how they, what the kids are calling these crazy acronyms now, but I think it's HHIP. Um, hip, hip. It's a hip, it's a hip one. Um, we know we have to work with the county's Department of Health Services, the sub-network providers in partnership with managed care providers. Uh, and we have a role as a city to connect those dots. I've already engaged with the Tarzana Treatment Center and LA Cares, um, I know is already engaged, and I'm excited about the possibilities with the HIP to expand the street medicine efforts and to bring much needed health services to the streets, along with more housing navigation and sustaining services. Now, one concern I have is that this is a different route to getting those navigators. And I was talking to LA Family Housing the other day, and they're they're going to look they're looking into how they can do it, but it means a different training. It means it means a lot of different ways. It's not as easy to access, and I'm worried about the fact that we only get this for a year. This extra, potentially unlimited amount of money. Not nothing's unlimited, but huge shot in the arm. But if we if if we can't stand it up fast enough, we're going to lose out on a lot of it. So we need to really. Um, if we can, if we can fund navigators and housing retention through Medi-Cal, we need to do everything. We need to throw down on that and do everything we can to get that money out the door. Uh, and I very much am worried in, in typical government, big bureaucracy fashion, by the time we figure out how to do it, it'll be the last day of the program. Um, because we get at the moment, we get one year. And that's it. I mean, it's just my comments more than a, than a question. Um, but that's why I put this motion forward to get to light a fire and to get us to identify this and to, to, for more people to see this as a huge source of funding for something that's desperately needed. Yeah, this is great. Um, and I, I really appreciate the really thoughtful policymaking coming out of members of this committee 
to think about how we can be strategizing across council districts, strategizing across jurisdictions, saving dollars and moving us more quickly towards um, and moving us more quickly towards ambitious goals around homelessness reduction here in the city of Los Angeles. Um, I'm I'm very excited about this. I don't have any additional comments and I'm comfortable moving this forward and really looking forward to feedback from uh, from the city departments um, and potentially, you know, with um, uh, uh, with more action and eyes on this from uh, our new mayor and, and county supervisors as well. So with that, can we call the roll? Certainly, Madam Chair. Council Member Raman? Yes. Council Member Rodriguez? Aye. Council Member Blumenfield? Blumenfield, aye. I think it's approved, Madam Chair. Great. Awesome. So let's move on to item nine, which I think will be a brief update from LASA regarding the ongoing room key demobilization. I think there's only one site that continues to have residents in it. So Mr. Vergao, I'm gonna turn the um, turn the floor over to you. Thank Wait, you. you need to read that. Do you need to read it into the record, Mr. Villanueva? Yes, Madam Chair. Go ahead, sorry. That's okay. Item number nine is a verbal update from the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority relative to the project room key demobilization plan. Thank you. Uh, again, Nathaniel Fregao, Deputy Chief of Systems at LASA. Um, thank you uh, for having me again for this update. Um, as you mentioned, we are down to uh, one remaining uh, room key site in the city of Los Angeles, that is the LA Grand. Uh, we do have a second site um, that is county funded, um, uh, that is the Cadillac. Uh, and we are actively demobilizing both of those with um, a goal of uh, being able to place everyone out of those sites by the end of January. Um, so specifically to the city site, we, um, as of December 6th, so earlier this week, uh, we were down to 186 participants on site at the Grand. Um, that is on, uh, on pace for uh, our demobilization plan. Uh, we are continuing to, um, to exit uh, approximately four individuals per day uh, in order to get uh, to that goal. Uh, primary focus being on permanent housing placements uh, with a secondary focus on uh, placement in interim housing, uh, ensuring that everybody has um, uh, is being offered at a minimum uh, two opportunities uh, for, uh, for interim housing from which to choose. Um, so that is that is my Brief update. I, I do want to say that these numbers um, are subject to change as uh, the mayor's office is um, uh, potentially using utilizing the grant uh, for a special operation, um, and um, so we will uh, notify you with any updates um, after that. Yeah. Okay. That was actually going to be my only question, but um, I'm glad to see that um, work is continuing and that. Um, uh, and that um, you're making the progress that you were hoping to make. Okay, let's move on to item 10. That was an item for discussion only. So we'll move on to item 10 without need for a, a vote, um, which is a verbal update uh, also from LASA. If you wanna read the item into the record. Certainly, Madam Chair. Item number 10 is a verbal update from LASA relative to the preparation, survey questions, and any changes in methodology regarding the 2023 point in time count. Great, and I think this is a useful update given that the last point in time count did generate, first of all, came out, feels like it just came out yesterday and now we're already looking at doing the next one. So um, I think we're working in a very compressed timeline, but also that the last point in time count generated some real questions from community members, from elected representatives and from the media overall. And so this verbal update, I think, will give us an opportunity to ask some questions to LASA as they begin the process of preparing for their next count and potentially allow us to ensure that the next count won't yield quite as many um, questions uh, after it's completed. So with that, I want to turn the floor over to Mr. Vergao again for this update. Thank you. Um, we do have just a couple of slides to be able to provide visuals to go with uh, the verbal update. Uh, Catherine, if you would. Are able. Thank you. Um, so again, uh, 
uh, Nathaniel Vergao, Deputy Chief of Systems for LASA. Um, thank you for in, uh, inviting us in to give an update for um, the work that we're doing towards the 2023 homeless count. Um, as you uh, stated, it does feel like it was just yesterday that the 22 results uh, were made, um, uh, were released, and, uh, and we are working on a compressed timeline. Uh, but we are also committed to uh, continuous improvement uh, in the count, and so I'm glad to present uh, some updates. Uh, next slide, please. So just super quick, um, the agenda again, uh, make sure everybody is clear on what the dates are for the 2023 homeless count. Uh, I'll go through some uh, new developments and plans that we have in terms of uh, improvements for the count for this year. Um, some quick information about uh, community information sessions and what some of the work that we've done leading up to this point. Uh, and then, as always, uh, if I may, I will make a pitch for uh, recruitment of volunteers because that is how this count happens every year. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, for this coming year's count, we uh, will be, uh, as we do each year, the count will be across three days to be able to cover the entire county. Um, uh, Lhasa has the uh, continuum of care lead for the um, uh, city and county of Los Angeles continuum of care. Um, is responsible for uh, the homeless count across the entire county, save uh, Glendale, Pasadena, and Long Beach uh, that conduct their own counts separately. Uh, we then, for our presentations after the count, counts are all completed later in the year, we do work with those uh, continuers of care to get their data to be able to provide countywide numbers um, for, uh, for the entirety of the county. Um, for, for this year, um, our dates for the count uh, are, as what you see on the screen, um, January 24th, 25th, and 26th. Uh, we will be focused in the San Fernando Valley, San Gabriel Valley on that first night of the 24th, uh, and then focused on West LA, um, Spa 7, which is East Los Angeles, and then the South Bay Harbor area on the second night of the count. And then third night of the count, um, we will focus in the Antelope Valley, um, and metropolitan Los Angeles and South Los Angeles. Um, the asterisk that you see on the Antelope Valley uh, is uh, uh, to indicate that there are large portions of the Antelope Valley that we actually count uh, in the, on the morning uh, of the 26th um, because uh, the, the desert areas, um, there's so little light, um, it, uh, it, it's unfeasible to, to do an accurate count in many of the areas of the Antelope Valley. Uh, accurately, so we do them at first light um, uh, on the morning on that morning. Thank you. Next slide. So, as I said, um, we are committed to continuous improvement, and so I wanted to um, review some of the work that we're doing uh, this year to make improvements for uh, for this coming count. Uh, last year, um, we um, there were a number of barriers that we faced uh, in the count. One of the biggest being. Uh, the Omicron surge that we experienced in uh, in the county in early January that um, pushed us to uh, push back the count from its normal dates, um, which uh, led to uh, a number of issues, including uh, difficulties with deployment sites, as well as communication and, uh, and continued commitment from volunteers. So last year, we did fall uh, well short of our goal uh, of volunteers. Uh, we have an uh, annual goal of Sorry, somebody's calling me on my computer. Um, we have an annual goal of uh, approximately 8,000 volunteers. We fell short of that last year. Um, as part of our shift in, in modernization, but also uh, as uh, a specific, there was some urgency in that shift last year uh, to move to an app-based count uh, so as to be able to minimize the need for um, direct face-to-face -face interaction um, uh, in the midst of, of a pandemic. Um, so we worked with, uh, uh, with Aikido apps, uh, Aikido Labs, uh, to develop an application for the homeless count last year, uh, which uh, initially um, was exciting, but then uh, we did have some, some struggles with that app. So we have uh, decided to go with a different application this year. We will be working with uh, ESRI, uh, which is a company that um, has uh, been a leader in the field of um, uh, geographic information uh, specialists, uh, geographic information services, uh, and they have an app that has been used by a number of communities uh, in uh, previous counts and has been been well tested. 
And so we'll be utilizing that application for this year's count. Um, you know, one of the biggest issues that we had with the count last year was uh, the user interface and uh, and folks finding it difficult um, to to utilize, as well as uh, on the back end some difficulties in immediately verifying information on the night of the count. Uh, we're confident that this new application uh, will be able to remedy that. Uh, additionally, we are. Uh, utilizing additional validation tools um, on the night of the count, including um, some more um, refined sign in and sign out uh, procedures with individuals that will require a sign off on and verification of uh, what was recorded in the application so that we can be uh, more confident in uh, uh, in each uh, volunteer pods uh, numbers. Uh, additionally, uh, we are, uh, LASA is planning to staff, uh, to have staff at each and every deployment site. We have um, uh, uh, approximately 175 deployment sites uh, across uh, the county over those three nights. Um, and those are in elected offices, neighborhood council spaces, uh, uh, often um, uh, facilitated through homeless coalitions or other faith-based organizations. Uh, this year uh, to uh, provide additional assistance for those volunteers who man those sites, uh, LASA will be having staff assigned to each and every site um, throughout the count, both to um, be available for additional backup for training for volunteers uh, uh, at the site, as well as those who are going out to do the count, as well as to be able to be in close communication with um, our data team back at LASA to be doing that uh, real-time validation of information. Uh, further around the data validation, uh, we have uh, over the last uh, uh, year plus uh, been able to implement um, geographic uh, uh, recording of information from our outreach teams. And so we are working uh, to be able to um, provide some, some models from our HMIS data for our homeless count team to be able to use as a comparison uh, to the data that does come through for the homeless count so that we can be doing some, uh, some, um, some validation in that fashion. We are also um, hiring a demographer uh, to assist us in uh, ensuring that uh, as we review uh, the data, uh, not as we review the procedures for how the count is done, as well as uh, reviewing the data that we have a, um, a, a specialist on staff that can uh, assist us in, uh, uh, in ensuring that the data analysis is done appropriately, especially uh, those pieces that, um, that apply to the uh, delineation of numbers between council offices because that is uh, it is not as, as straightforward as it might seem. Um, let me see. I want to make sure that I'm hitting uh, all of um, the points here. Uh, additionally, um, uh, we we have been testing um, the app already uh, and are inviting um, a number of partners to assist us in that in that testing so that it is not just. Uh, loss of staff who uh, who may have uh, some familiarity with the tool, but bringing folks who've never seen the tool in to offer them the training uh, and and test the application um, to ensure that the the usability um, uh, is there um, and uh, and the, the ease of use uh, um, is present. Um, in one of the other issues that we uh, we faced last year was uh, around the youth count. Um, uh, many of uh, the youth count is done a little bit differently than the, indivi the uh, individual adult, adult count um, because of the fact that uh, many youth, um, uh, more youth are, are not as visible uh, as, uh, as our unsheltered adults. Um, so many youth um, uh, find uh, different places to sleep because of their unique vulnerability as, uh, as young folks. Um, so we do the youth count a little bit differently. It is um, based primarily through uh, through surveys. Um, traditionally, those have been done um, in large measure through our youth access centers. Uh, at this time last year, many of the youth access centers uh, were not open uh, in the same way that they traditionally are because of uh, the COVID surge, uh, because of um, staff being out sick, et cetera. Um, so we are expanding how 
uh, we do the youth count. Uh, we have gotten authorization from HUD to be able to utilize uh, phone surveys um, as well as the in-person surveys that we've done um, and are uh, expanding the number of sites beyond just the access centers to ensure that we are getting a comprehensive youth count uh, this year. Um, apologize, I'm gonna pause for a moment, just review my notes to make sure I've got covering everything here. Yeah, I will, um, if we can go to the next next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, um, you know, we began working on uh, homeless count 22-23 even prior to the announcement of, uh, of the results from last year's count. Um, but we've uh, really ramped up in uh, over the last several months. Uh, we had a number of um, forums with, um, with community members. Uh, we uh, have um, in the focus in the first weeks of November, I apologize, it's a, I believe it's a typo, uh, uh, community agreement forms uh, we, where we uh, worked with communities across the county to ensure that we have the deployment sites um, set up and, uh, and have uh, clear commitments from, um, from those entities to be able to utilize the sites on the night of the count uh, and the uh, supports needed to be able to operate those sites. Uh, we began our uh, volunteer recruitment already, um, so our homeless count website uh, is is live. It, um, it is uh, theycountwillyou.org. Uh, we are um, hoping to recruit as many as 8,000 volunteers. Uh, so we did open that site earlier this year than we have in years past uh, and have already begun uh, a massive email push to uh, individuals that have volunteered in the past, as well as our entire list serve that we have uh, at LASA. Uh, as I mentioned, we've been doing testing of the Homeless Count app um, uh, that actually began in November and has been primarily focused in the month of December. And then we will have the count itself in January. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we uh, additionally um, uh, wanted to make sure that the council members were aware that we do have a social media toolkit available. Um, that your offices uh, are welcome to use. We are um, distributing this social media toolkit to uh, all of our partners uh, with the goal, of, I said again, of uh, ensuring that we get enough volunteers. I can't stress enough the, the importance of our volunteer recruitment. Uh, the count cannot happen without uh, the volunteers. Um, and so- I'm uh, committed to getting those volunteers. No. I think this this group of uh, council members is very enthusiastic. We had I, I, I don't mean to be uh, pitching you all. It's more to the public that may be watching. Um, but uh, so uh, apologize for taking a shameful moment of, of plug here. But um, <laughs> no, no, no problem. I was just saying you got you got partners in us on this. Absolutely. Um, again, uh, our the website is here on the screen. Uh, they count will you dot org. Uh, anybody who is uh, interested in volunteering whether it is to go out and do the count or to assist at a deployment center, um, please uh, go to the website uh, and register um, and you can begin the training and the connection and, uh, and we look forward uh, to that. I think we have one last slide. Yeah, so just again, the, the nights of the count, the 24th through the 26th and our website and I'm glad to take any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Regal. Can you talk, um, you talked a little bit about ways in which you are internally going to be verifying the count numbers. I think one of the challenges that we're facing on the issue of homelessness is the broader question of trust in the system to be able to move forward. Um, and part of that trust comes from data related issues. Do you have um, kind of related to some of the issues that came up in the last homeless count. Like for example, I remember reading about one um, precinct in Venice, precinct or uh, census tract in Venice that was, um, you know, found zero people who were experiencing homelessness um, when, you know, the previous count had found a large number and it seemed very unlikely that there were none. Um, have you, kind of looked at what had happened in the last homeless count to see how some of those discrepancies may have come about. Um, and then my second question is really uh, about public trust and public trust building. Um, are there plans to have the validation work that you're doing be made publicly available? So that you're doing, for example, across the city, a comparison of 
homeless count census tracts versus other methods of arriving at the information related to the census tracts that are compared or some kind of validation efforts that you're you're where you're making the information about that validation publicly available so that you're saying not only do we have this information we've collected this information using the methods that we've traditionally used and improved upon but here's how we're validating it and here's how we're presenting the results of that validation to you so it's two separate questions but just one uh, would love for you to speak to both of those yes um so um on the first point, uh, and it's connected, both are connected, so I'll just respond in, in, to both at the same time. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, we are looking at um, other methods to be able to validate the, the information that comes in from the count. Um, our uh, first line of defense uh, around uh, mistakes of any kind uh, is validation on the night of the count. Um, so we, as I mentioned, we are, um, uh, one significant change is the, the application itself. Um, that will um, be much more user friendly, uh, be much easier for folks to be able to utilize. We are um, uh, we have um, plans in place in terms of being able to validate the numbers that um, that are counted uh, when folks return to the deployment site. So we are going to require that uh, volunteers return to the deployment site, sign off to validate the, the numbers that they counted. Um, and uh, to ensure that that uh, is recorded uh, and that there's a mechanism to record that immediately. Um, uh, and then that information, the, the tally itself will go to uh, USC, which is our demographic partner that does the, st the statistical analysis. So we, uh, we have some mechanisms uh, at the site to be able to, uh, to validate the information that was uh, collected and ensure that it is recorded. Um, both immediately uh, and, and then uh, also through uh, the data that gets forwarded to, uh, to USC. Um, additionally, as I mentioned, we are looking, uh, and, and that's why we've brought on the demographer, uh, to look at other uh, data sources that can be used to validate um, the, uh, the information that is gathered through the count um, and uh, to help us uh, better explain um, uh, how the count functions. It, uh, you know, we do need to be clear this is the, the count uh is not uh an exact count of the number of individuals experiencing homelessness it is a statistical model to be able to uh, give us the best uh, estimate uh, of the number of folks who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness um, or sheltered homelessness because we do a shelter count as well um, on those nights in january um it is uh we we've never pretended uh and uh and need to be, I think, better in our messaging uh, around the fact that it is uh, a statistical estimate uh, of that point in time. Um, and again, uh, part of the reason that we brought on the demographer is to be able to uh, assist us in, uh, in the messaging, as well as ensuring that folks understand um, how the data is collected, compiled, uh, and how that, that estimate uh, is derived, uh, as well as to be able to assist in uh, breaking down the, the overall count to the smaller geographic areas. Uh, it is the count, uh, I'm not the best person to explain this because I'm not a demographer, but my, uh, my understanding of, uh, uh, of the way uh, the process works, and this is uh, from conversations that I've had with our partners at USC, is that uh, it is most accurate uh, as the large number for the entire county, um, and as it just uh, attempted to be brought, broken down um, to smaller jurisdictions like city council districts, uh, is where we lose some of the the accuracy because it is not designed as a as a count at the micro level. Um, city council so, district is enormous, so it's not really a micro level. But so I, you know, I just but compared to the four uh, four thousand square miles of, of the county. Uh, it is. And again, uh, I, I would prefer that we have our demographer come back and, and explain uh, in, in greater detail those because that is not my uh, my area of expertise. But. OK, so I think it might be useful at the next meeting to have the demographer come back, because I do think that there is still, a, a, for me, some remaining. It sounds like from what you're saying that the errors that we found in the last homeless count really came about because you had an app that was malfunctioning or that wasn't as effective as, as you had hoped and you're gonna be replacing that app now. Um, but I, I do think that there, there does need to be like, 
people need to have faith in the numbers for us to be able to move forward as a city and continuing to make these investments. And some of those people are the elected representatives who make decisions about um, what we're spending on data on the basis of those numbers. And, uh, you know, I, I hear you that that micro level data is not as um, accurate as the um, analysis for the entire continuum of care, but, you know, these are enormous jurisdictions, the council district level jurisdictions. And there are cities across America that are the size of those council district jurisdictions where we are doing counts and we are generating data that is used by HUD to allocate information for those jurisdictions. So it doesn't quite, you know, the, the explanation, I hear it, but I'm it just doesn't quite sit right with me. And I think it's important to have the demographer back so that we're able to have a deeper discussion about what that means and ensure that the data that's produced in the next homeless count is both accurate, but also generates faith in that accuracy um, among leadership in the city, as well as in the broader public. Are there other questions from members of this committee? If I could just respond just real quickly, uh, that that is our um, our goal, our commitment, as I, as I said at the very beginning, uh, we are committed to continuous improvement uh, of the count and, and frankly of all the work that we do. Um, and uh, you know, the we are we are confident that um, the measures that we're taking uh, to be proactive in uh, in addressing uh, any of the issues that came up last year that we're we're working on having multiple fail safes in place. Uh, so uh, as I said, it's it's both night of validation, uh, secondary sources of data for comparison, um, uh, uh, as well as, as as other items that the demographer would better explain than I, uh, but we are uh, working to have multiple fail safes in place uh, to be able to have uh, confidence in the data. Yeah, and Mr. Vigao, I have deep, deep respect for LASA and the work that you do, you know that. I work very closely with you and your staff on a lot of these issues. My the point I just want to underscore is that I think we not just have to do the work, but we have to show our work. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's what I want to get us to, Mr. Bloomfield. Yes, thank you. No, and, and work very closely with LASA too, and have great respect. Uh, but I also had a lot of concerns with the the, the count, as as you know, uh, Nathaniel, because I've brought many of them up in the past. But why why is it that we don't? Is it impossible to do a point in town, time? count that is actually a count of people, why why do we always move to an estimate and not the actual count? Uh, well, for one, that's the guidance that is uh, provided by by HUD. Uh, and so to be in compliance with HUD, it is well, not HUD intended. Allows both, Excuse right? me? HUD allows both. It allows you to simply report the number of people counted or to use a statistical sampling extrapolation. Yes. And uh, in conversations with HUD, our, the guidance has been um, that uh, for us to be able to get uh, a, a more accurate uh, picture of homelessness would be to use the statistical modeling. Um, in uh, in going out and doing just a visual account, um, in order to to be able to uh, ensure that we were counting every individual that was um, was is unhoused, would require that uh, we were going to each and every tent. Uh, and uh, counting the number of individuals, uh, that is uh, an extremely huge lift across a jurisdiction as large as uh, as Los Angeles, um, not to mention the fact that uh, it adds an element of, uh, of danger potentially for the volunteers. The communities that do the literal count of, indivi of, of individuals are much smaller communities, and those counts are usually conducted uh, by law enforcement or uh, agencies like that um, that are able to engage uh, in in a, uh, directly with individuals in a way uh, they're trained to be able to, to do that uh, from a um, uh, uh, an emergency public public safety perspective uh, to be able to do that appropriately. Um, so in, if we were to do that uh, without having a statistical uh, model that can provide us a valid estimate of the number of individuals that might be residing in each uh, recreational vehicle or each tent, uh, we have a significant risk of having a dramatic undercount uh, of the individuals uh, that, um, that we have uh, that are unsheltered in, in the city and the county of Los Angeles. I will say that uh, San Diego uh, attempted uh, to do a uh, um, a one for one count of individuals, um, not in the last homeless count, but in the one before that, um, they did get permission from HUD to do so. Uh, they were then 
uh, they were very clear that that was not a successful count. They saw a tremendous reduction in the number of individuals counted um, and uh, reverted back to utilizing a statistical count uh, to be able to get a, a more uh, appropriate estimate of the number of individuals experiencing uh, homelessness. Although the statistical count has a lot of potential flaws in it as well. I mean, I, you know, for example, I, I know one one particular individual's experienced homelessness who is who is a resident at the bridge home. He has a tent and he has an RV. Um, and so, under our methodology, he's counted once for being in the in the bridge home. He's counted three times for being in the tent, of which it's his own tent that's empty. And he, or two times for that, and then three times, once two and once three, and then three times for the RV. So that one individual who I know to be an individual who has a tent that he stores things in and an RV that he stores things in is counted for six. So we also have this other problem, which is our statistical true up. I, I don't know how we get to those statistical true ups. Maybe that's for the demographer. Um, but I think there's a ser some serious flaws in it. Yeah, the, that is why we do uh, the thousands of demographic surveys um, that we conduct in addition to the night of count. So USC has um, uh, surveyors that uh, are conducting demographic surveys uh, that will begin later this month and go through March, uh, where they will survey individuals uh, across the county uh, in uh, in districts across the county, uh, conducting thousands of surveys uh, to ensure that we have a, a picture of the number of who the individuals are that are experiencing unsheltered homelessness. And among the questions that are asked are, do you live in a tent? Do you live in an RV? And the number of individuals that live in, uh, in that um, structure with you. Um, uh, and that is how we derive uh, what is uh, often referred to as the multiplier, uh, by which we make the statistical estimate of how many folks are actually living in the tents uh, and RVs that we see on the street, which is why we uh, we saw an actual, uh, um, uh, in the last count, uh, the, the estimate showed that we did see an increase in the number of, uh, of tents and structures out on the streets, but fewer uh, folks were residing in each of those tents and structures because of the information that we were able to gather through the demographic survey, and that is to to account for individuals like the the, uh, the person that you just mentioned. Um, so in years past, uh, we would have uh, uh, we would have uh, considered more uh, individuals likely to be in that tent or the RV. Um, but because of, of the demographic surveys, we are able to estimate that there are fewer individuals in each tent and RV uh, to account for the fact that there are folks who, um, who are utilizing tents potentially as storage or um, uh, and have accumulated potentially more belongings because of the, um, the slow slowing of cleanups that occurred during the pandemic. Yeah, although I, I'm assuming there's a way to get at it, but you wouldn't get the zeros by just talking to people of asking them how many people are in your tent because uh, you're not going to talk to an empty tent. Um, but presumably there's a way to get around that. But how, this may be related to that. How does the count determine the number of homeless individuals experiencing severe mental illness? Again, through the demographic survey. Uh, uh, in the demographic survey, uh, that is where we get uh, all of the, the color uh, uh, of the count. Well, so how, how does that then get applied? Because I there was just a remarkable statistic that I just don't believe that was it, it had in this year had the number of, of people with severe mental illness in my district being 17 percent and then the adjacent district to my north being double that um, you know and that doesn't make any sense that that there would be you know one in the 17s or one in the 36 and and so I have to feel like and I, I haven't been able to drill down on the statistics of how that's done but um, I'm hard pressed to believe that it's, a, it's such a huge delta in virtually the same population. And not, not to mention that the whole number, I think, is low. But putting that aside, the delta is there's no explanation that I can understand. And maybe there's one out there. And maybe I could I could feel better about the number if I understood better the demographics of how they come up with that because it just didn't make any sense. 
So you said that the number of, of people experiencing severe mental illness is determined by the demographic surveys. The demographic surveys are done on a district basis? Demographic surveys are done, uh, uh, statistical modeling done by USC. I, I, uh, USC would be the best person to ask uh, to get the details of exactly how they uh, how they deploy uh, the demographic de demographers for those surveys. And uh, we are, they, yeah, just to clarify, we wanted to, I just want to say that there have been some questions that's come up where Mr. Vergao has referred them to the demographic surveyor. So we'll send those across to yeah. you um, so I, that in our next meeting, we can make sure those are answered by uh, when, we, when we, he or she comes. Yeah, we could request uh, USC, uh, that is, they are the uh, uh, statistical analysis contractors uh, for us. They they conduct the demographic survey um, and do this, it's just the, apologize, stumble over the word, statistical analysis um, uh, of the demographic surveys that provides us uh, the, the, that detail. Great, and I, won't, I didn't mean to put you on the spot on those, and I know that that's not your area, it's just, as you can see, there's there's a lot of frustration out in the community, but with myself as well as, as this last count, a lot of those numbers still don't make sense to me. So I look forward to hearing, dealing with the demographic uh, folks and, and having some further discussion there and, and appreciate appreciate the, uh, the item. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rodriguez. Thank you. Um... Bob, I mean, you're not off the mark on this. Um, and it was actually one of the discoveries that uh, during the uh, during the 2019, when did we first go into COVID again? Was it 20? No, 2020. Uh, I, I don't even remember anymore. But it was the 2020 release of the homeless count numbers that got delayed. And I have to give credit where credit is due. But my, you know, my staff and I remember we had an emergency meeting with uh, <clears throat> with Heidi, uh, because we did, we discovered uh, problems with the data. And, you know, and I know they've rectified it. And I know you all have, Nathaniel, you guys have rectified some of the processes with USC to clean it all up. Um, but again, it's the, you know, it's the estimations um, based on that's informed by the SPA leads. Is, is that correct? I'm sorry, re repeat the question. I had trouble hearing you. Sorry. The it's much of the estimations are, are derived from the experiences of the spa leads and outreach and kind of ascertaining uh, in terms of what the, the multiplier is. No, right? the, the, multi the multiplier, those are all determined by the, through the demographic surveys that are con conducted uh, by uh, USC. Uh, they uh, developed the instrument uh, along with our homeless count advisory board in terms of uh, trying to get information uh, locally that uh, we are wishing to be able to collect. Uh, and then um, through the thousands of surveys that they conduct, um, that is where the multiplier and information about uh, race, gender, ethnicity, uh, et cetera, are um, collected. Now, if I, but if I re recollect, I thought it was also informed based on the, uh, the what is ascertained through the outreach and, if, and what, uh, what the SPA leads have also kind of experienced or and or what LASA has helped to inform in that process. Because I, I remember questioning <clears throat> at the time, and this is how we derived, that there were errors with SC's process. Um, because as you know, I, I basically asked, I said, uh, you know, and I asked, I remember asking Heidi a very simple question. I said, who checks USC's work? Which is the why data, we've, which the, is why we've the hired the dem demographer to be able to do that this year. Correct. So it's because because what I said is, you know, your num the numbers that you're producing are only as good as the numbers that you're inputting. And so how are we making sure that the data is accurate? How is all, you know, that there's, uh, who's, who's watching who in this process is part of the, is part of where we determined and identified uh, and actually, frankly, as a result, delayed the release of the homeless count numbers in 2020 because we discovered this error. And so, <clears throat> you know, I, I believe that there's there's there needs to what we what's necessitated is a continued, um, you know, obviously uh, review of this process uh, to ensure that you know again it it feels like it you know because Bob I, I completely understand your point uh, particularly as it relates to 
look, it informs our conversation even as a result of the settlement uh, with the Alliance case. So many, there are so many pieces that will be informed and affected by the calculations. Uh, and, uh, and we know it's not clean. And we know it, uh, frankly, you know, absent another more efficient methodology for us to, uh, to get a more accurate count. <clears throat> we, you know, we continue to uh, produce these numbers that then affect every, you know, there's a, there's an equal reaction to each of these, uh, this processes that has not been further refined. We have to figure out another, you know, an additional way of actually tracking and measuring uh, the, the work. But frankly, so much of this is also about, um, you know, our responsibility to our residents. It's a, it's a very real and candid conversation uh, that we need to have in terms of repopulation of some of these areas as well, so that we can actually show the headway and produce the results for, uh, for, for, for many of these areas. Because uh, as we know, uh, and I've, I've said this before, is we've seen the other cities that have not been producing or have in fact been doing and leading with enforcement uh, that then puts the burden on the city of Los Angeles. It's a very real conversation and people need to be uh, really respectful and, and thoughtful about that uh, because <clears throat> we're all in the same county. We're all relying on the same, very same support services that will ensure our uh, success uh, in addressing the homelessness crisis, but we have to have accountability and we have to have these hard conversations. Uh, and I think that's imperative because the residents of Los Angeles, they deserve success. They deserve results when it comes to this issue, having assessed themselves multiple times over uh, to address this uh, to address this crisis. So um, <clears throat> I just think it's imperative that we continue to uh, to really reflect very deeply on what this process is question and challenge uh, some of the, the numbers as they are produced, uh, because again, it is a moving target, but it does have a tail wagging the dog effect on how we allocate resources, how we design our approach and response. Uh, but more importantly, uh, it's also to the, it's been to frankly the benefit of some of these other cities that are, very, that are within the county that are being absolved of any responsibility to do their part. And so I just think it's critically important that we continue to um, <clears throat> exercise a great deal of uh, oversight in this process. Um, but, you know, look, our, we all remain very committed to our work and in, in helping to lead in our respective areas with the homeless count. Um, but we all have to just continue to do our due diligence um, in this process because it, it's, uh, there's a lot, of, there's, there's just frankly way too much money uh, that incents, in my opinion, uh, the types of numbers that I think only sustain uh, us funding this, this work and never, and never having light at the end of the tunnel. So, thank you. I'll just say that I uh, uh, appreciate uh, and we as, as an organization uh, welcome uh, the critical eye, the critical feedback. Um, the the issue that you raised in terms of the former count was specific to the youth count, and uh, and corrections were made. Uh, and uh, you know we've we recognize that the, there has not been uh, a flawless um, exercise. And uh, as I stated at the beginning, and we'll continue to to repeat, we are committed to continuous improvement uh, and are um, uh, committed to uh, developing and ensuring that we have. Uh, multiple ways to be able to validate the data and uh, that we are um, working to ensure that um, that it is uh, at the night of the count, uh, at the point of the demographic surveys, uh, and at the intersection of the two uh, in that analysis, that we are uh, having multiple ways to validate the data and having additional sources uh, to compare that data to, uh, to ensure that, that it is not uh, off base. Uh, and, but invite uh, you all to, to continue the, 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 the critical uh, looking at the data and, uh, and um, 
and any any and all feedback that uh, that can be given so that we can uh, improve. Great, thank you so much, Mr. Vergao, for being here for initiating this topic with this committee. I think there's a lot of people, not just on this committee, but on the entire council. Um, who deeply care about this issue. Obviously, it's one of the most important issues um, here in the city of Los Angeles, but also I think want to work to develop that trust um, in the system. Like we, I think we're really here to fix this system, to make it work better um, and to make sure that it's really answering the needs of the moment and the needs of Los Angeles. And we really appreciate LASA, appreciate the fact that you um, proactively bring these issues to us report so thoroughly on them and are here and present with us throughout this process in, in moving this forward and look forward to continuing to engage with the demographer you're hiring um, in our next, whenever our next meeting is um, and uh, continuing to engage on this question so that we can, we can get numbers that we're all, we can all rally behind um, and really use for really excellent policy making going forward. So thank you again. Um, Mr. Villanueva, do we have any other items to discuss today? The desk is clear, Madam Chair. Okay, fantastic. And so that wraps up our last meeting um, of the Homelessness and Poverty Committee for 2022. Uh, and thank you both for your presence here today and for your engagement on in this meeting and in all the other meetings that I've had the pleasure of sitting with you at. We may well, be looking forward to some thank changes. You. Thank <laughs> you for stepping up as chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, unexpectedly and taking that on in addition to your other roles. So thank you. I appreciate that. It's been really fun and I've really enjoyed um, acting as the chair of this committee over the last couple of meetings. And you both bring like such incredible questions and thoughtfulness to this discussion. It really feels like we're all rowing in the same direction and trying to make things better. And I just, I really appreciate that. And um, it's just been a, it's been, it's been a treat um, even despite all of these negative circumstances for me to be able to sit in this role um, for this time. So thank you both for your support, for showing up to all the meetings uh, and um, look forward to um, hope, hopefully sitting in this committee in the next year, uh, but we'll see. Um, right. So thank you all. Thank you.